this is Yes to Zine, the show where we take a single issue of an old gaming magazine and see if the highest and lowest rated games deserve their treatment. This episode, we're going with the first issue of the first magazine I bought after I got my Amiga. I'd had a Spectrum for six years at this point, but for whatever reason I'd never bought magazines for them. I'm not even sure what changed, but in any case, come May 1992, I'd got myself a second-hand Amiga 500, all hooked up with the expansion to a whole megabyte of RAM, £3.50 in my pocket, and I was in WH Smith looking for an Amiga magazine. Whether I picked right in going for the one over Amiga Power is a debate for the ages. Probably I didn't. But I remember being swayed entirely by the appearance of Lotus Turbo Challenge on the cover. Driving games being my thing both then and now. A demo of a bike game on the cover that looked jaw-droppingly pretty to a boy who'd only seen Spectrum and Sega Master System games at this point absolutely sealed that deal. So the one it was. And by chance, it was a hell of a month for Amiga games. You'll understand when we get to the Stone Cold Classic that got the highest score, but the three runners-up are all still remembered today. The fourth highest rated game was classic isometric puzzle shooter Degeneration. A tale of a trapped courier who slowly discovers what's going on as he tries to fight his way out of a company headquarters filled with genetically engineered bioweapons. It's a combination of action and brain-melting puzzles that both Amiga Power and PC Gamer put in the upper regions of their all-time top 100s. So for this to be only the fourth best game in the issue, then there's going to have to be some very special games above it. And that's certainly true of third place, the first Championship Manager game, an absolute moment in the history of video games. The series, now known simply as Football Manager, has by 2019 transcended gaming and its data, compiled by over a thousand dedicated researchers, is used extensively by real football clubs to narrow down the field of potential signings and scout opponents. That was a long way off here though. The first Championship Manager doesn't even have real player names at all, only covers the top four leagues in England, and has graphics that can be best described as, yes, those are technically graphics. The 93 update adds real players, but can be almost entirely broken as a challenging game by always offering players the maximum possible win bonus. Nonetheless, it ate an absurd amount of the lives of myself and several school friends. We'd be sat there at break time with printouts of our first 11, who we bought them from, and how much we paid. In Championship Manager 94, I took Wickham Wondrous to the European Cup, proving there are some things that will only ever happen in video games. In the near three decades since, Championship and then Football Manager has continued to get bigger, smarter, more complex, and even more popular. But none of them have ever quite recreated the magic for me that was waiting 10 minutes for my poor old Amiga to process the end of a season. Still, it's an impressive achievement for what is basically a glorified spreadsheet to become one of the most enduring game series of all time. When The One reviewed Championship Manager in July 1992, we were still 18 months away from the first FIFA game. EA were one of the companies to turn down Championship Manager before Domart picked it up, a decision made by the same guy who told the Beatles, rock music is dead. Both our top two are from the genre that, driving games accepted, defined my childhood. And yet, this one I never played. Revolution Software's Lure of the Temptress. Revolution these days are more famous for the long-running Broken Sword series and their second Amiga effort, the seminal Beneath a Steel Sky which I'm sure is going to come up sooner or later. This though was their first game, and a hole in my own personal adventure gaming history. If that's true of you as well, I at least have good news. Lore of the Temptress was released as freeware a long time ago now, and can be downloaded entirely free on PC. I'll stick a link in the description for you, and we'll just have to meet back here later to discuss if we were idiots for not playing it in 1992. Amiga Action, in their review, said that Monkey Island fans will lovingly embrace it. That actually might explain why I never played it, because in July 1992, Monkey Island fans were already occupied. Yep, just pipping the incredibly unlucky revolution to the winner in July was a game that any fan of point and click will be very familiar with, and one of the many, many adventures I played through with my dad. It's the incredible Monkey Island 2. Having vanquished the evil pirate LeChuck some months ago, Guybrush finds himself at something of a loose end, so he starts looking for the fabled treasure of Big Whoop, which he's incorrectly heard is located on Scab Island. When he discovers his information is false, this is a problem, since the island's governor, Largo Legrand, is not allowing any ships to enter or leave. 
In an effort to bypass this, Guybrush ends up creating a voodoo doll of Largo, but unwittingly manages to lose LeChuck's beard to him in the process, which Largo, who is LeChuck's former first mate, uses to resurrect his old boss, who is less than thrilled about the whole deal. Monkey Island 2 was my first game in the series. We were a Sierra family in the late 80s. My early adventure history almost exclusively ends with the word quest, be it space, king, police, or a leisure suit Larry. The early Lucasfilm Games titles, such as Loom, Maniac Mansion, and Zack McCracken had passed us by. That didn't matter too much, as mostly MI2 doesn't rely on much from the first game once you establish the existence of LeChuck, and it started me on a voyage of LucasArts adventures that continued for as long as there were LucasArts adventures. But it's 2019 now, and does it hold up at all? Well, on this format, there's an immediate issue. The Amiga version comes on 11 discs, a number beaten to my knowledge only by the aforementioned Beneath a Steel Sky. This means playing it on a 1 megabyte Amiga 500 as I tried to do for this show is an exercise in pain. To get to the first meaningful bit of interaction from boot requires six disc swaps between four separate discs. And then the unskippable first encounter with Largo seconds later prompts another 10 seconds of disc access, somewhat ruining the surprise. Leaving the first area for the map requires another swap, and then another entering the next area on the map. I've captured the whole Surrey process in a bonus video, and that has the potential to be longer than this episode. That said, the game has some tricks. It tries to be clever about what areas it keeps in RAM, so going back and forth should avoid some loading, especially on Amigas with more RAM to play with. It also supports three extra drives, so with the right discs in, you could get right to the start of the actual game without having to swap any of them. And it can be installed to an Amiga hard drive, which would almost entirely eliminate the delays. If you're coming to it now though, this is a job for ScumVM, a free re-implementation of the LucasArts engine that's available for just about everything, including modern Amigas. If you're doing that, using a PC version file with it, as I've done for most of the footage in this show, will give you better colours and some of the music and sound effects that had to be cut from the Amiga version for space. A further option is to play the 2010 remake, available for several consoles and the PC, and if you're coming to the game entirely fresh, I'd recommend that for both this and its predecessor. It's the same game, dressed in slightly more modern clothes, to the extent that you can switch between the old and new graphics with a button press at any time. There's even a full voice option, which you can use and still keep the classic graphics if you wish. Where do you think you're going, fancy pants? You ain't from these parts, are you? This is a toll bridge. It also adds little modern adventure game touches like an audio commentary, a hint engine, and highlighting of the hotspots on the screen. All of these will help with those surprisingly rare moments where Monkey Island 2 feels its age, with a little bit of clunky game design. There's some pixel hunting you can now avoid, for instance, and one puzzle in the hard version of the game that involves spotting movement in something that's absolutely tiny when playing the original release. For instance, in part one you're going to need a knife at some point. It's right there on a table, but in 32 colour Amiga glory it's really tricky to see and has a hitbox the size of, well, a knife in a big room. Wait a second, Dudley. I'm going to assume you said for narrative continuance. Hard mode? In my adventure game? Yes, Monkey Island 2 has a hard or easy mode you choose at the start of the game. The hard mode is billed as the original experience, and they're probably right. It's no harder and probably less obtuse than any other adventure game of its era. Easy mode though is a lovely little addition. It simplifies some puzzles, including the movement hunting one I mentioned earlier, and removes a few others entirely. It's done very well, and you'd probably never notice the cuts until you replay in hard mode and suddenly discover something is no longer as straightforward as you thought it was. Here's an example. In part one you need an item of Largo's clothing to make the voodoo doll, something of the thread as the voodoo lady puts it. If you're playing in easy mode, you use the knife to release the innkeeper's pet, which allows you to sneak into Largo's cabin, at which point you can steal a freshly laundered shirt off the bed. When we get to this same point in hard mode, then you're going to have to create that laundry. There's a bucket you can take in the laundrette. We go fill this up with mud at the swamp. And then when we sneak into his cabin, we do the old door trick. Once you've followed Largo to the laundrette, you can see him book the clothes in for cleaning. 
the claim ticket for which is now hanging on the back of his cabin door, ready to be used to retrieve the now clean item of clothing. It does introduce some logic inconsistencies. The laundry owner talks about a claim ticket in the easy mode, which you can never get, so it could send you up the wrong path by giving you clues about puzzles that don't exist for you. And so, probably it's the best idea to play the full fat version straight off, and use recourse to the new hint feature in the remake if you get really stuck. If you're using the remake, that's your only choice, as easy mode isn't available in the newer version. Alternatively, play through easy mode in Scum VM first and treat the remaster as the ultimate in director's cuts. Despite being 27 years old now, Monkey Island is every bit the game it always was. It does help that point and click games of this type are sadly rarer now, and that the remake has been done in a very respectful shot for shot way. But good writing and good puzzles do not age, and so our first game in this series delivers our first unreserved recommendation. The creator of Monkey Island, Ron Gilbert, left LucasArts after this game, so had no part in the two direct sequels, Curse Of, and Escape From, Monkey Island nor the much later Telltale Games episodic series, Tales Of. More recently though, he has written two new adventure games, The Cave and the really excellent Thimbleweed Park. Also involved was Tim Schafer, now better known as the founder of Double Fine Productions, who recently remastered several LucasArts adventure games, such as Day of the Tentacle, Grim Fandango and Full Throttle. While they didn't do the Monkey Island remasters, you'll find him on the audio commentary, along with Ron, and the third creator, David Grossman. So Monkey Island is a winner, but what of the lowest scoring game? We'll get to that in a minute, because first I want to look at that motorbike game from the cover, the one that tipped me over the edge to buy the magazine in the first place. The game in question is Red Zone, and for a kid whose best looking bike game was something like Codemaster 750cc Grand Prix on the ZX Spectrum? It was an unimaginably pretty beast. Look at the colours! Look at the bikes with recognisably roundish wheels! Look at how I can tell the bikes apart from the lines on the track! And while I don't remember, I suspect the demo really didn't disappoint 1992 Dudley. It's actually a bit of a looker for its time. Yeah, there's no textures. But even the almighty F1 GP by Jeff Crammond didn't have those on the Amiga. It's clear. It's got the detail it needs. The draw distance is okay, only the frame rate is a little disappointing. The other problem is the bike, controlled by the mouse, is near hilariously sensitive. The distance between full left and full right on my mouse is maybe a centimetre tops, which accounts for me wobbling around the track in this footage like I'm trying to cycle home from the pub drunk. But for a fun little time trial curio, it's really not bad, although moving the mouse that little is a surprising strain on your wrist. I did however pop the full game in for a try, and then things break down rapidly. The opposing bikes are triangles with hexagons, and no rider, and they're near impossible to avoid. Having to race rather than just get round the track also has the effect of exacerbating the issues with the sensitive controls, so I certainly see why when it got to review it got a mixed reception. From my research I understand that if you're willing to throw what would have been 1500 pounds of Amiga into the game, then the frame rate gets massively better. And of course I'm sure I could fiddle to artificially make the mouse less enthusiastic. But the effort seems not worth it in order to race five nameless, shapeless drones. The cover disc demo version though? By all means take it for a couple of spins. My record is 42 seconds if you want to crack at it. The rest of the discs had completely slipped my mind. On replaying, the only other game of note is a Mega Race, which at the time they saw as an Asteroids clone. But in 2019 is far better described as the grandfather of Geometry Wars. It's probably the least justified insistence on a 1 megabyte Amiga ever, having absolutely no music, about 3 sound effects, and no graphics you couldn't draw on an Etch-a-Sketch. But it's not exactly a problem for us to have a 1 megabyte Amiga, and what you'll find is a lovely little shoot 'em up enhanced greatly by a brilliant difficulty curve, and the tactical possibilities of using the score box in the middle as a shield. A tactical shooter is not something common in the Amiga days, nor am I sure it's actually what they meant to write. But write it they have, and play it you should. Can't put it off any longer. We're 2500 words into this video after all, so it's time to look at our first clunker. And for this issue it's Spoils of War, which I've never played before now. It appears to be some kind of bastard child of civilization and something like Battle Isle, 
And to be fair, I had both of those games, so I probably wouldn't have looked twice at something bad enough that even the Eternal Optimist at the 1 gave 48%. Gentleman editor Jonathan Davies was equally scathing of it at Amiga Power. Amiga Action and Amiga Format didn't even touch it. For some reason, CU Amiga gave it 82% when they finally reviewed it six months later. Judging by the other reviews, I suspect it took them that long to figure out how to play the thing. Both The One and AP complained about it being about as friendly as a lion demanding to see the manager, but I don't see that on first impressions. That's a lovely little menu screen with four simple and sensible options. Further experimentation reveals this is a screen where you set up your team and the opposing factions and presumably some sort of difficulty level. And then you're into the main thing, where it's menus, lots of menus, menus that might mean something, presumably. I've bought some units of indeterminate type, I think I've moved them to places, I've played for a solid 20 minutes and nothing appears to have attacked me or moved near me or anything, as far as I can tell. Let me show you a typical turn. I can move my explorers around a bit, but despite my opponents all supposedly being on this little island, none of them seem to have emerged to do anything about me. I don't seem to be able to put a settlement of mine anywhere or attack anyone. Apparently capitals are off limits. I can imagine Civilization being equally awkward to someone, but Civ at least has decent tutorial pop-ups, even in the first version released. It also has the comprehensive in-game Civlopedia, so you could at least muddle along long enough to fall victim to the bug that makes Gandhi a completely irredeemable warmonger. It's possible, of course, that some of this is explained in the manual, but I can't seem to find the manual online anywhere, and worryingly, the review in The One makes special note of how useless the manual is anyway. There's not even a lot of it on YouTube, which is always a terrible sign. I found what was basically a slideshow of reviews of the game, and one capture of that lovely little introduction, which reveals the game is also known as Conquestador, which is either a god-tier level pun or a bad mistranslation. And so, I'm not sure we can make a terrible amount more progress here. Genuinely, if you know this game, leave me a comment or drop me an email. I don't feel I'm giving it a fair chance here, through its complete incomprehensibility. It may well be what we've discovered here is the Championship Manager 93 of Wargames, utterly incomprehensible to normal humans, but some sort of narcotic for those into its subject matter. Or, and I think this is more likely, it's just a terrible old incomprehensible game that others have done the subject matter of far better. Civilization for one of them, but also any number of turn-based wargames. German Design Group are actually still around somehow, although their under construction website is so obtuse that I genuinely can't work out if their latest product is a video game or a board game, which probably explains much about the likely quality of the instruction manual for Spoils of War. In any case, this is a game I'm very comfortable leaving back in the history from which it came, and maybe I'll just go play the PC version of Lure of the Temptress, which again is now available free and legal on GOG.com. As always with magazines, the back page is an advert. This month, for Lefaris' fantastic Amigurama podcast. We extend our thanks to him for supreme levels of technical help on this episode. If you want more in-depth looks to Amiga games, we highly recommend you check it out on YouTube or in audio podcast form. More details for both can be found at his site, Amigurama.com, or on Twitter, at AmigaramaPod. If you need a starting point, he covered the first Monkey Island in episode 4. Flicking back to the inside back page, we remind you that subscriptions are available free at the touch of a button and come with the free gift of our undying love. If you wish to contact us, feel free to leave a comment or email yesterzineshow at gmail.com. You'll find notes on this show and more about it at yesterzine.co.uk. Well, that's this issue ready to go into the overpriced licensed binder, and we'll join you camped outside of Virtual John Menzies waiting for the next. Cheerio! Cheerio!